www.doublespot.com. Thank you for listening to the official YouTube page of Midnight Triple Feature. Please, while you listen, head over to midnighttriplefeature.blogspot.com. You can check out past shows, reviews, or link up to social media where we can keep in touch. Thank you for listening. All right, welcome to this edition of Midnight Triple Feature. I'm Mike. Adam's here. Hello. What do we got planned for today? Gilgamesh. Okay. A uh, independent film uh, due to be released on video on demand and limited edition signed and numbered DVD on February 3rd. We had the opportunity to take a look at it a little bit early and uh, we're going to have a review for you today. Uh, so I'll give you a quick overview, uh, plot synopsis. So a military expedition in Siberia gone wrong, the existence of humanity is in peril as Inanna, Sumerian goddess of lust and war, has summoned a giant meteor to destroy the planet after being accidentally set free from her ancient prison. The government has been overturned in a communist takeover and the citizens of the world brainwashed. In humanity's darkest hour, the ancient entity of Gilgamesh, older than the cosmos themselves, must decide whether or not to serve of mankind's final hope. Meanwhile, Inanna has hand-selected the one man, married man and archaeologist David Murphy, to live out the rest of eternity with her. Gilgamesh and Inanna are quickly targeted by the new government as potential weapons of mass destruction, and soon the apocalypse has begun. So this film was acquired by uh, Legless Corpse uh, to distribute, directed by Richard Chandler. Uh, told in flashback style, this is just, uh, let's see, that's more synopsis. So, the Boston-based auteur felt the moment was right to unleash his vision of cultural chaos upon an unsuspecting public, even though he spent a few years developing the material. The first draft of the script was a lot longer, he says. I had to cut a lot out just to make it economically feasible. Chandler raised over $5,000 through a successful Kickstarter campaign, which supplemented fonts he himself laid out for the project. I'm pretty sure I saw on IMDb a, a budget tag of 30000 which seems about right. I mean, this wasn't made for $5,000. It's that, that definitely was in supplement of something else, because they've got things in here that I would guess cost more than five grand oh yeah um the crew for the dystopian drama is comprised of familiar faces that have previously worked under chandler shingle boston film family llc uh so it is a boston production it's kind of close to home for us it is uh long new england yeah long time collaborators steve sandberg todd therian and richard chandler senior worked as associate producer production manager first assistant director and second assistant director sound man new to the team with director of photography andrew zabatkin and line producer angel connell uh gilgamesh was chandler's sixth full-length feature so this isn't his first Film, which I think is obvious. I think you can tell that this this guy's made movies before. This isn't a first time effort. Yeah, no. Uh, the native New Englanders' previous feature credits include Scrooge in the Hood, which sounds amazing, by the way. <laughs> I have I no idea what that's about. I but that, saw that when I was that looking title, up. <laughs> that title <laughs> has me sold. Uh, Heaven and Hell, Legless, Our Kingdom Come, and Sons of Perdition. And he also created a locally produced hyperviolent web-based series called Boston Massacre. That ran for one season. So, Gilgamesh. Right off the bat, I'm going to say that it's we've reviewed a good amount of indie indie features on a show, uh, ranging from, you know, a $3,000 budget up to, you know, say about $30,000 budget, whatever. Maybe higher. This is probably the most ambitious indie project, indie film that we've ever covered on a show. This yeah. is a film that... For an indie, for an indie film, covers a time span of, you know, Vietnam, what, late 60s, early 70s, all the way up to, uh, Siberia in 2032, and then Boston in 2030. So, they're actually kind of taking some risks, because for an indie project to go for that, you know what I mean? To try, to try to say that we, we are going to go for it and try to convince our viewers that, we have a film that's taking place in multiple countries over a, I don't know, a span of 50 years, whatever it is, 60 years, more than that. Um, and I want to say right off the bat, I think they pull it off relatively well. No, yeah. Right? It's done really well, actually. Yeah, like, I admit I was actually surprised at, at how convincing this film was, cons- you know, particularly considering it's an indie film. Yeah, the 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 way it was shot and the actors that portray those characters are really good. Yeah, the actors are good. The one that plays Guy, 
You know what I'm talking about? Uh, the one that ends up um, sleeping with Inanna. And she gives him the one-stroke hand oh, job. yeah. She gives him, like, the fastest hand yeah. job in the history of hand jobs. Um, him, like, I- I'm pretty sure that that dude was just playing himself. Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Completely natural, good chemistry between him and the other guy. I'm-, I'm guessing they all know each other, so maybe that's part of it. Yeah, the acting's good. It is. Like, we've seen really bad acting in some of these movies. We've seen... A lot of them are really just bad. Yeah, and we've seen a lot of bad production value. You know, this is... It it actually... It's well-directed, like you said. I mean, it's it's got... Obviously, the cinematography is relatively creative. Yeah, the cinematography is great. Like, here's... I'm going to give you an example. So, you have a scene in a room with... So, it's... I want to say it's David... And he's being interrogated by some military guy, and he's got to tell them his story of Siberia. And in a lot of movies, we we see like the indie production. He's is, from The Sopranos, by the way. Yeah, I know he yeah. is. Yeah. <laughs> um, we we would get this is this is how it would be shot. You'd have your two people at a table, and a camera. It would you'd get a shot of him talking, a shot of him of the other guy talking, a shot of him talking, a shot of David talking, him talking, David talking. It would be two shots. But, like, they actually change angles. They actually have cutaway shots to the other guys in the room. Like, little things that seem really dumb. That seem small. Yeah, make the whole scene. But, yeah, but you know what I mean? They make it feel like a whole scene. It makes it feel like they took the time to do something simple as cutaway shots. Yeah. Something that are incredibly important that we don't see enough of in, in indie productions. That are, you know, they have the forethought that they're making a movie where they're clearly doing multiple takes. You know, at least that's what I'm led to believe by the fact that they're using cutaway shots in multiple angles, is that they're actually doing multiple takes and they're trying to make a movie not on the fly, but that's an actual, you know, fully fledged out project. Yeah, no, and it, yeah, you don't really see that a whole lot, especially in the lower budget. It's usually like one take, one shot, camera never moves. Right. They do it really well in here. Right, and I'm I'm like, I'm not going to bring up the names of the movies we covered in the past because they're not relevant to this, but... There were a couple movies in particular that were clearly just done on the cheap, on the quick. Yeah. You know what I mean? They didn't even care about where the camera was. You know, and like those types of things are important. You know, if you're telling a story, you're trying they to make a movie. don't clean up the audio. Right. Do Yeah, it's, like it's the just, audio was pretty good yeah. in this. Like really shy. Like there's a scene where they're in a bar and they're all... I was just going to right? mention that. Dude, that scene is well lit. Yeah. It's well filmed. It's that's a really and think about good the scene. sound in there, right? So like they may like how how often would you would you watch a scene like that and you would have all these issues with levels because you'd have all they managed to have everybody in that bar actually talking and you can hear it. You can hear the people talking, but at no point does that background noise Affect. ever interfere with the conversation. No, and you hear the conversation right. clear. We have watched movies <laughs> where right. you can't even hear the actors right. because of the ambient noise, the people talking in the background, mm-hmm. cars driving, whatever yeah. it may be. And you hear them perfectly clearly. You're concentrating on what they're saying, but the ambient noise around them is just there. Right. All right, so... So the filmmaking is good for sure. This is fantastic. Yeah, yeah. It, like I, the fact that it was able to keep me engaged for its running time. Um, like again, I was surprised at some of the techniques that were going on. The, the actual quality of filmmaking was ho- much higher than I would have anticipated. I was quite impressed with it. The thing that really attracted me to this movie when I uh, when we got the we got you know the release and we, the press release and I was reading through it is you know the premise. This idea that they were basically making a modern day exploitation film. So here's the other thing is that they take on a pretty big task of, <laughs> you know, movies basically about a communist takeover of the government. I was taking notes and I wrote down sci-fi political thriller. Yeah, and it's got, but it's got this nice little exploitation vibe to it. It does. You know, cause it's, you've got these two like female, I want hench women, I guess. So like hench women. And they're dressed like what you would expect to see, you know, I always go back to like what I think of as trauma or, you know, post-apocalyptic type movies of the 80s where they're wearing, you know, fishnets and, you know, like their hair is colored and they're very punk rock and stuff like that. And uh, that, that exploitation element just, I think, helps make it a lot more fun. The guy that plays the Russian leader, the one that's in yeah. charge, he's yeah. great. He's awesome. Yeah, like... But no, that's one of the things I like about this is it's like, it's a real, like a gritty, 
exploitation feel to it. Yeah, it does, yeah. And I really like that about this. Yeah, like the only thing that would have made it that much better is if, you know, if it weren't shot digital, but you can't help that, obviously. Yeah. You have well. to shoot it digital. And I'd rather have them shoot a digital clean than have them go in and After Effects and try to add some effect to make it look older. Yeah, but, no, no, I don't mean gritty you know, as in... yeah. Like the way you're seeing, like yeah, but I'm saying film. like that yeah. feel comes like from if, yeah from that era as well. You yeah. know, like when you watch a 70s or 80s exploitation film, it's also just a feel of the way that it, it's shot on film and it's got that grain to it. And it's a, you don't get that with this, but you don't expect that with this. No, so it's just got that type of feeling. It has. To it. You're right. It emulates. That feeling. It's even got like that Ilsa type character. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like she's she's not obviously as over the top, but she's kind of an iteration of Ilsa. Another thing that I really enjoyed about this was, and you don't see this a whole lot either because we have already mentioned that we have covered movies where the the score, the music was absolutely just terrible yeah. and didn't work. This had like this industrial rock music. Yeah, and they would pair it with, with like this oh, like class with this yeah, classical music. Exactly. Like, yes. Yeah, which really yeah. And the industrial this, stuff has a it's it's used really well. The classical stuff is used really well. Yeah, the score. I, I yeah, because it was thoroughly all, enjoyed the the mix of it. Yeah. They were all like uh, they all had their scenes. Like the industrial rock would play, you know, during you know this scene here, and then. When say something took place back in the day, you would have like that nice classical music. Right. Like I, I want to really say, good. like they were playing the industrial stuff when the two girls were beating up the senator in the chair. You know, when they were beating the crap out of that guy. And yeah, it was. <laughs> again, it's it's all these little elements that come together that just make make the movie enjoyable, that make it watchable. The effects too, like they're you know they're obviously low budget effects. Like, you know, they have the, elect, uh, I don't know what you call it, I guess, like the lightning bolt effects. And those yeah. are all done. In- With the doctor and his eye. Uh, <laughs> yeah, eye. but it's like, it's. I think it's funny. I think it's yeah. supposed to be funny, right? And like, doesn't like his eyeball pop it out? It pops out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like you see the little eyeball yep. pop out. I don't know, it's a nice... It's a nice little detail. I think, like, the meteor itself is cheesy, but in a good way. The way yeah. it just kind of, like, floats there, you know, and it's, like, covered in... it. it I don't know, it's... um. It's got that like low budget cheesy feel, but the movie itself feels like like it's uh it's what's it what's the th- what's the word you know it's more professional than that, so everything feels intentional you know what I mean like it doesn't feel like the effects even though the the effects are the way they are due to budget, probably they feel like they're that way on purpose, yeah, I get what you're saying you know what I mean like something like when we talk about manborg and how that feels on purpose. Yeah, but, you know what I mean. Like those effects feel like they were there on like pre thought out on purpose, and that they weren't necessarily just due to budget. And a lot of the times, with you know, with uh, lower budget movies, if you get a really bad effects, it could just throw you out of the whole thing. Yeah, and like, that's what I'm that's saying. That's all you're concentrating yeah. on. That's all. Scenes later, that's you're still thinking about that crappy effect. Right. These effects weren't terrible. Yeah, um, they weren't great, but. They didn't throw me out enough to go, oh That's my god. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. They, they just kind of went with it. They feel like, it felt like they belong there. And again, it's that feeling of, even though I, I know that it's probably budget, it feels intentional. It feels like that's what they would have wanted no matter what. You know what I mean? Cause that's the movie they were making. Yeah. I, I can't explain it any other way. What did you think of, say, the casting itself? So you have Inanna, who's the, uh, the god of lust and war and then you obviously have gilgamesh who i i mean that was an interesting character gilgamesh i i wanted more of him in this movie yeah um you i like I, I liked what he was wearing like I, the, yeah i liked the, the yeah. costume yeah the, the, costume dude, was the awesome. guy seemed pretty dude that dude the guy was jacked he was yeah. right i mean it's kind of hard to tell but he definitely looks jacked i like the scene where he's slaughtered where he's just running through like he's going through that base in siberia and he's slaughtering everybody and there's that, that one guy like having sex with the chick, and then he's got a gnarly axe. That man. thing is awesome. That thing's oh, yeah, it's I want so that. So fucking cool. <laughs> <laughs> Hang that up on the wall. That thing's nice. Yeah, I would have actually liked a little bit more of him in the movie. I don't think he's quite prominent enough, and I he's a a pretty cool character to look at. I like Inanna too. I think she's um, she does come off as confident, powerful. Yeah, exactly what you would expect. Yeah. Again, it comes down to acting, I suppose. Is that she does manage to pull it off. Yeah, she, she needs plays that, that character. She needs that confidence yeah. of I've been alive for you know millions of years and I can do what I want, get who I want, and no one can stop me. 
convincing. Yeah. No, she didn't get a job. Uh, so I don't know how much more I want to say. I don't yeah. really want to get into the plot too much. Uh, no, well, I don't want to spoil it. Because, yeah, that's yeah. it. I kind of would like people to seek it out themselves, and there's a lot of stuff in here that I don't want to spoil. But I just say that I had quite a bit of fun watching it. Yeah, me too. <laughs> I actually, yeah, I, I really did like it. Yeah, I get nervous sometimes with these indie films because you never yeah, know. Me too. You know, yeah. we always give them a shot. I mean, that's... And yeah, we're, we're honest. Know. We're always honest with these things. Yeah. Like, you can go back and listen to some of our <laughs> reviews, and we're pretty honest with these, yeah. with these features, so... No, this year, I, I, I fully enjoyed it. Like I said, I love the exploitation feel. I love the grittiness of the movie. I love the way it's shot. The characters are great. The acting is the good. The acting's there. Um, um, music is fantastic. I like the ambition of it. Again, I think that it's really ballsy. For a low budget it production is. to go for that, to be like, yeah, we're ba- you know we're in Boston, but we're gonna try to shoot a movie that takes place in Vietnam in the seventies or sixties, and in Siberia in two thousand thirty two, and in Boston in you know two thousand and thirty, whatever it is. So I gotta give them props for that because they, especially the Siberia stuff, they pull off pretty well. Like they managed to, I don't know where they're shooting in that hangar. It, uh, it's, it's well, convincing. pretty much everything was. I think it was. Boston Mass, just yeah, outside of Boston. It was, but like... And then Rhode Island was one of them, You look I think. at, like, the scene in the hangar, when they're in Siberia and they're in the plane hangar, and there's something about, for whatever reason, they just convince you with that location that they are where they are. There's no... It's not like just an empty room, a blank room, and they're telling you where they are. They're actually trying to convince you that they're there. They do a pretty good job. Yeah, no, so, they do. Um, <laughs> you can find it through Legless Corpse Films, because they're the ones that are going to distribute it. So I'm going to guess if you look look them up, they're on uh, Twitter and all that good stuff. And then I guarantee you, you'll be able to find uh, Gilgamesh through them. That's probably the route because I don't have their Facebook or Twitter, but I'm sure they're up there. Here, I'll just let it run. Check it out. It's coming out on VOD on February 3rd. And they're local. They're from Boston. Yeah. So let's support New Englanders. Yeah, support them. So. They did it. This is a, a production company that. Um, uh, you know, that deserves, <laughs> yeah. deserves support. You know, hey, when you put in the time and the quality, effort yeah, this is and quality put out quality, product. they're trying to give you a product that, that you'll be happy with. So, yeah, I recommend it. Me too. And as always, you can find us on the web at midnighttriplefeature.blogspot.com, on Twitter at MT Feature, and on Facebook. Feature, and on Facebook. Feature, and on Facebook. Feature, and on Facebook.